This is Eastman's Elevated Podcast. I have on great guests that are really knowledgeable, consistently successful. We're able to dive deep down the rabbit holes of these different subject matters of shooting, of physical fitness, of mental toughness and drive. All the different skills that make up a complete hunter that you can become. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's happening, guys? Got a brand new Eastman's Elevated for you. So this week on the podcast, going to sit down and do a solo episode. So I'm um, going to record one, uh, going to talk about you know what I'm working on this time of year, but um, I, I definitely want to do intentional podcasts. And so this intentional podcast is on spring black bears. Uh, so I'm going to talk about spring black bears, talk about them with archery, but of course, any of this information is useful, and I'll talk about rifle as well, as I think guys should take advantage of those opportunities, especially you know, when they're new to bear hunting or they haven't harvested a bear yet, as bears can be a bit of a black magic. So we'll get right into it. Just want to thank a couple sponsors, and then we'll get going with the podcast. Okay, I want to thank uh, Cutter Stabilizers. So my friend Earl Stroll started this company and saw a need for this in the archery, in the bow hunting community, as well as target archery. But he just, he builds such great products that hold up to all the abuse I can throw at him and everybody else. Uh, stabilizers on your bow, they can make a major difference as you can fine tune the hold of your bow, fine tune the reaction of your bow, and also the follow through. And so this has been a big part of my accuracy is using cutter stabilizers. So I use a 15 out front, a 12 out back. I like my back end to be a little bit heavier. So I believe I've got 10 weights or 10 ounces on the back. I've got six on the front and it just holds so rock steady for me. Uh, I think it's a major advantage. So this year when you're setting up your bows, make sure to look into going with some stabilizers where you can adjust the weights by one ounces like cutter. Uh, they have a great sidebar bracket, which a lot of us bow hunters are taking advantage of. Uh, but there's still a lot of guys that haven't tried a sidebar. Getting that weight out the side as well as the front just makes for such a good hold of the bow. So uh, check these guys out. They're producing great stuff, uh, and, and it's a great uh, do-it-yourself company that Earl started from scratch. He's now been at it five years, seven years at this company, just producing great stuff. They always stand behind it, so check them out over at Cutter Stabilizers. I also want to thank Matthews. I uh, got that new Matthews lift shooting really good. Um, had my buddy Dan come down. He's got a new lift. We set that thing up. Uh, but things just absolutely shooting. They just have such great performance. Uh, like I'm gaining, um, you know, like around 8 feet per second, 9 feet per second off other bow models. So getting a lot of performance out of it as well as... Uh, you know, it's just um, such a forgiving, good shooting bow. So getting great groups out of it. And it really seems to hold a tune once I get a tune in it. So, uh, and also the quietest bow I've ever shot. Like I shoot around other bows and there's a noticeable difference. So I think this gives me a real advantage shooting at axis deer, whitetails, mule deer, and antelope as they can be real jumpy critters. So having a quiet bow is just clutch. Uh, but yeah, just a great bow. Uh, I've been using them, gosh, like probably the last seven or eight years now, and I'm just so impressed every year the new model, and this year's lift is no different. Uh, it's a great bow, so if you're in the market for a new bow, make sure to go check them out, shoot all the bows, see which one fits you right, uh, but I guarantee that Matthews is building a good one. I also want to thank Outdoor Edge. So Outdoor Edge is a replaceable blade knife. And um, man, this has just changed the game for me where I don't have to bring multiple knives. I don't have to bring sharpeners. Uh, you know, I can just bring one knife and bring multiple blades. And then it's always just razor sharp, uh, ready to do the job for me. So check them out over at Outdoor Edge. I also want to thank Black Ovis. Black Ovis is an internet retail shop that has absolutely everything you need for your next hunt. They carry all the top name brands as well as their own name brand. So uh, you can save 10% off if you put in the promo code ELEVATED10. Uh, you also might try the extra 10 in the promo and see if you can save a bit more there. But a great company, great knowledgeable staff, and great gear. So check those guys out. 
And with that, over at Eastman's, yeah, you can check out our Beyond the Grids. Uh, that'll be our um, internet TV shows. Just search Eastman's Hunting TV. You can find those. Uh, you can check us out, uh, Eastman's Tag Hub. Uh, so Eastman's Tag Hub, uh, our internet research tool. So uh, we're now building this out monthly, so it's built out like a like an Amazon or Netflix or something like that, where you always have access to it to study up and be able to learn these different states and uh, be able to learn uh, these um, different units and opportunities that are out west. So you can check that out at Tag Hub. We still have our Mule Deer course available. We're always adding to it. Um, promo code for that, Brian MDC, that'll save you 10%. And uh, the magazines, Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal and Eastman's Hunting Journal, as well as our other podcast. You can check out that other one I do with Dan Bacar, uh, Life of a Bow Hunter, Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal. Search that. It's on a different feed. Uh, it comes out bi weekly, but I'm really proud at uh, the content that we're putting out. So check that out. And with that, let's get into this podcast. So, a solo Eastman's Elevated. It's been a while, so um, but I just hit record. But I, I like I was saying in the intro, like I really want to be intentional with the information that I bring you guys. So, um, have some notes, have be organized, and uh, have a layout, and um, you know some guidance to 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 be able to abide by. So I'm giving a talk at the Montana Bow Hunters Association. This is going to be a live talk. We're going to do it, um, let's see, it's the first weekend in April. I think it's like April 5th. I'm going to speak Saturday, I believe. Um, oh, gosh, I should have all the details. But Saturday afternoon, I think around 4 o'clock, uh, I'm going to do like an hour and 45 minutes and going to do spring bear talk. Um, so that's up in Great Falls, Montana. So um, definitely want to give you guys all the information that I'm going to talk about and also gives me a chance to uh, practice and brush up on my bear hunting and um, be able to get familiar and like kind of rehearse a talk that I'm going to give up there. So, uh, man, I love hunting spring black bears. Uh, I love this season. It's just the ultimate adventure. And I, I really feel like my with my bow and arrow, or any weapon for that matter, that it's like entry-level dangerous game. So, you know, I get some excitement out of it. I mean, definitely some excitement. And um, some thrill. And I really feel like I need to be on my bow game like 100%. Like, um, you know, the these bears can charge, especially after hit with arrows or, uh, you know, if you uh, have a wounded bear or something like that, can get dangerous pretty quick. So, like, um, I just have to be so in tune with my hunting, so in tune with my bow and confident and capable. And I, I feel like it's like the ultimate test for me. And so I love hunting spring black bears, but you know, black bears, there's not as many of them in these ranges as ungulates. Like they're, um, you know, they're predators. So their population densities are lower. So it can seem like a bit of a black magic while hunting these things. Like I'll have, um, Usually by the end of the season, I can average about a bear a day, but there'll be quite a few days in there where I don't see a bear. And so it's a bit like having to do the right thing day in, day out, the right hunting techniques, the right tactics to keep theorizing, keep putting yourself in these good places, and then eventually there's a bear there. So, um, you know, I'm all self-taught. I started hunting bears like probably about... 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And, you know, I hunted them first with my rifle and uh, was able to get a bear with a buddy. And then, gosh, it just wasn't quite for me. But once I, you know, started taking up like hunting them with a bow, I started to get that intense like dose of adrenaline when I got a stock on them. And, you know, I just always loved the bow and the close encounters. And so being that close to bears was really exciting to me. And so that's why I took on the challenge. And then I just fell in love with it. And I've been doing it every season since. So, um, yeah, like bears, like, where do we get started? So there's less of them than ungulates. So, you know, you've got to get more in tune with them. And, and bears... They have specific habits based on the time of year. So springtime, their numbers really get condensed, which makes them a good season to hunt for them in. And also, you know, we have cabin fever. We've been um, inside or at least um, haven't been able to hunt for a few months now. You know, maybe you caught a late January hunt, but uh, definitely a few months without much bow hunting going on unless you took a big trip or something like that. So I'm always eager to get out and... 
I just like I feel like my bow hunting, like the key to me being successful is really the amount of of experience I get, like the amount of experience I get bow hunting, being able to travel to these different places, like different species and different habitats. I've always told you guys that. And, um, you know, also like just being in the mountains, like, um, you know, trail running, I'm in the mountains and I have to be in tune and keep myself safe, but really like, like horn hunting or bear hunting or say turkey hunting or any of this stuff. So hunting bears in the spring gave me a chance to be out in the woods in the springtime and really gain experience. And there's years, like it's open from April 15th to June 15th. So see, that's about um, 60 days. And so, you know, out of those 60 days, I get quite a few because I can go the evenings after work or weekends or take a day off here or there. And so I get quite a few days. So, you know, I might pile in an extra 20, 30 days throughout the season. So, um, you know, I, I really gain like a lot of experience that makes me better come deer and elk season. I mean, the other thing is bears make me really good at dialing in these mountain winds. And these mountain winds, like if you could master one part of bow hunting, if you could take one variable out of it, if you could just take the wind out of it, uh, the wind busts so many stalks and good encounters with all these animals we hunt. But bears... Bears can smell seven times what a bloodhound can. And bloodhound can smell thousands of times or uh, better than humans. I can't remember if it's hundreds or thousands. But it's crazy what bears can smell. Like, they are so tuned in with this sense. Like, they can smell... Like, they can tell time by by scent and smell, like, when an animal walked by or when an animal came through. And, like, I like to think of a bloodhound, too. I've said this before, but they, like during kidnappings and things like if somebody kidnapped somebody and they had them in their car and they drove down the road a, a bloodhound a day later can track that scent that came out of that the the car vents and track where that car drove and a bear can smell seven times what that can smell so like if you get busted usually if i don't kill a bear if i get busted it's usually the wind now they can also hear you they can also see you but they're fairly nearsighted and so if you stop moving even in a wide open meadow they don't pick you up but um what what bear hunting makes me better at is dialing in these winds so i'm better come deer and elk season what bear hunting makes me better at is like the ability to grind the ability to go out in days and not see bears but keep putting forth that effort like keep theorizing where they're at and where the next spot is Uh, bear hunting makes me better at at dialing in these species like you know e-scouting and and scouting and all these different things to find these good locations finding vantage points and so you know bear hunting really improves my skill set especially being able to add 20 or 30 days of experience every spring chasing these things around and they're extremely difficult like i think you know black bears in montana spot and stock with my bow and arrow is quite possibly the one of the most difficult animals i hunt they're just difficult like um you know, I don't bait. Of course, we're not allowed to here in Montana. Don't use dogs. So it's all spot and stock. It's all glassing them up and being able to make a play on these animals. And I'd also say it like makes me better at closing deals. Like a lot of these bears, like I hardly ever see a bear close. They're always like miles away. And so I'm having to put on this big stock and then this approach and it's really high pressure and it makes me better in those high pressure moments. And, and two, I've just fallen in love with hunting them in the spring. I mean, there's boars and sows and there's color phases and size and and really a a big mature boar gets me going so I like love hunting these things um you know identifying the size and sex can be tough with these bears and so you know it just takes some practice and seeing a lot of pairs and you know there's some stuff on the internet that can help you out there's videos there's pictures but spend some time really learning how to identify these bears 
So first off, when I see a bear, I'm going to look to see if she's got sows or see if it's a sow with cubs. So the cubs usually won't be too far behind the mom. They'll be exploring around. I've seen it before, like in the early season. We're going to talk about the different seasons, but I've seen it before in the early season where she has them stashed in a cave or uh, they're kind of stashed away while she's out feeding. And so you have to spend some time with these bears and be sure that she doesn't have any cubs around. So that's going to be your first tell. And then sows from boars, and they can get tricky. Like, we don't have a bait barrel to compare them by. We're just looking at them through glass. And I always carry a spotting scope when I'm hunting bears because I want to be able to take a a close, better look at them to be able to identify them because, uh, really, I'm I'm going for mature boars, and I want to know what they are before I make a play. So when I glass up a bear... You know, I'm going to look for mannerisms. Big bears have a waddle or a walk to them. They also have an attitude. I'm going to look at, like, the body structure and size, but that can can fool you too. I've seen some good-looking body characteristics on, you know, big sow or good body characteristics, but it is a giveaway. Like, if there's no... A big bear is going to have a sagging belly. Uh, You know, a boar is going to have thicker arms, more muscly front shoulders, front forearms. And then I really dial in on the head. I think the ears are a great tell as the ears are the same size whether they're a big bear or a small bear. So if it's a small bear and it looks like Dumbo, it's got great big ears, like I can tell it's a small bear. Uh, Other giveaways, small bear, like small chest, um, you know, that's also a sign of a a sow as well, is she's going to be bigger in the back end than the chest, and a boar is going to be bigger in the chest and the front arms. Uh, The head, um, so the ears are a good giveaway. If they're small and on the sides of his head, it's probably a pretty good bear. If they're big and Dumbo-sized ears on the bear, then you know it's going to be a small bear. And then I look for the the head size, the head shape. If it looks like kind of a German shepherd or a long pointy nose, like that's going to be a sow. And so what I like to do is you can like draw imaginary lines between the ears and from the ears down to the nose. If it's a right triangle where all the sides are equal, you know, that's a good sign that it's a boar. So you want to see the same distance between the ears as you see from the ear to the nose. If you see a small distance in between the ears and a long distance down to the nose so it's going to be a long triangle that's the sign that it's a sow so I'm looking at at all these things and how this bear is walking around to be able to judge it and you know black bears are not a huge animal Um, so you know it's different in all areas like size of bear that you're looking for and and it's going to be different between all individuals of you know what size you're happy with and you know a lot of these bears are four and a half to five and a half feet and when I say four and a half to five and a half feet I'm measuring like if you lay out the hide I'm measuring between the two front pads and that measurement's usually the same or roughly the same as from the tip of the nose to the end of the tail. Um, so, you know, big Alaskan bears, um, and bears in BC, they're looking at seven foot plus bears. Now, Montana, we can grow seven foot plus bears, but I've killed a lot of awesome, great big bears with big skulls that are only six foot or six foot three, six foot five, somewhere in there. So like, uh, uh, to me, what I'm looking for in a trophy boar is I want a six foot plus boar. And I want a skull size that's going to be roughly like 18 and a half, 19 inches plus uh, something in there. And, um, you know, it's it's also like a good way to tell is if you can see a track of the bear. So a track will tell you the size of that bear. Basically measure the width of the pad on the front pad. And, and so if it's four inches, you add a foot to it and it's a five foot bear and it's remarkably accurate. Like when I kill bears, I measure their pad add a foot and that's roughly what they'll square. So, you know, if you're seeing a five inch pad, that's a six foot bear. That's a good indication. It's a good size bear that you want to get a better look at. Now, sows can also go six feet, but most of the sows are going to be smaller in the five foot range. And, um, you know, they can get six foot if they're old or good genetics, uh, but once you start to step into the six three, the six fives, the six eight, seven foots, those are most of the time going to be going to be boars, almost every time. So um, uh, I'm looking for a trophy size bear that's six foot that has an eighteen and a half inch plus skull. 
And, um, you know, a, a really good bear is going to be as filled out or as fat in the chest as he is, like, in his stomach. So, like, when you lay out a hide or a rug, he's as thick in the chest as he is in the in the back end. And so, as I'm looking at these bears, you know, it just takes looking over them and getting a judge. And it's really tough. Medium bears can be tough. But once you see a big one, you can just tell the attitude, the size, the waddle, the head. It'll have everything. And also, like the nose it's like it's like a a big stovepipe coming off a a round basketball head like i'm always looking for these pumpkin headed boars that are really filled out if you can see a cliff or like a like a wrinkle in between his eyes up on his forehead that's usually a pretty good sign that he's got a bunch of fat up there and a great big head so it's kind of what I'm looking for when I see these bears for me to make a play and and not to say that everybody should shoot for a six foot bear I've killed a bunch of five and a half foot boars 18 inch skulls or so that are great boars I've just come to the place where I really want to give my chance myself a chance at a great big one and so I'll kind of hold off those medium boars and and two there can be boars that are shot at five, five foot three. We killed one last year. Uh, Clint killed it. Yeah, you know, my buddy and and um, gosh, it was like a five and a half footer, or five foot three. He had that thing aged, and it was in. It was like a teenager. It was like a really old bear, and I don't think it was regressed. That was just the size it was. And so, you know, to everybody, it's going to be different what your standards are. But really, a five and a half foot good boar is a is a great boar to take. Um, you know, if you've never killed a bear, then maybe you're just looking for like a five foot pluser, something like that. And, you know, I've killed a couple five foot bears in my career. They go smaller than that even. And it's just tricky. It just takes a lot of dime looking over bears to find these big ones. But that's kind of what I'm looking for when I'm field judging. So time of year. So it's going to be different time of year depending on where you're hunting. But the Idaho, the Montana, things of that nature, like they really tend to come out at lower elevations first. And so as those elevations green up, those bears come out of their den. And what I notice is in the early season... I find a lot of bears in denning locations. So they'll come out from their den, they'll explore, they'll feed around a little bit, then they'll return back to their den if it gets to be gnarly weather, or they'll return back at night. And so this is like the first, the, the, the first action in the spring with these bears is like coming out around these denning locations. So this time of year, like I usually, like for me here in Montana, it's April 15th to May 1st, and those are rough guidelines, but these bears start to come outside their dens, and they're just starting to feed around, and sometimes they'll just be feeding on slopes that don't even appear to have a bunch of green grass. They're just coming out, exploring around, feeding on what they can find, going back in their dens, and so, you know, they'll they'll run this routine for up to a couple weeks or so, and so in the beginning of the season, I'm looking in this habitat where it has denning location, so I'm looking for steel deep rocky terrains um they like like i find them on a lot of south open facers like in the rocks and in the crags um i I find them in like rock slides and just real gnarly terrain and so this early season it can be a good chance to kill a bear because they'll be repeat offenders they'll come out and wander around their den but their denning location is right there so you have a few days where they're really hanging around that den coming out exploring around and so you can catch up to them and you know they're going to be in that area so it's a pretty good time of year you can strike out this time of year as well Uh, but i like to go rough rugged canyons rocky uh, gnarly caves and things of this nature. And so that's what I'm going to hunt like the first couple weeks. And now then these bears will move into kind of the next phase of spring bear hunting where they really get keyed into the food source. And so I really find that these bears, they love that, that bright neon green grass. And a lot of times when I sit down on a vantage point, I can pick out the greenest spot and then that's where a bear shows up. So they're really drawn to this food source. So I um second part of the season they get on the grass and they really get on the meadow grass and I think this is a great time of year to kill a good boar as they're in that meadow grass basically the timber hasn't greened up yet and so what I like to do is I like to follow the snow melt in the spring so there's an elevation where the bears will be at and it's usually like a few hundred feet below the snow melt or where the snow is where you just get the greenest grass that's coming up and it's it's actually getting getting its water from the snow melt 
and it just really greens up and these bears like it call it the green wave so as it as the green wave moves up the mountains these bears move up as well or start coming out at these elevations and so i really key in on elevation and if i see a bear at 6500 feet i make note of that and i look for other spots at 6500 feet that are greening up the same as that one now bears really like to be secluded so it's going to be different depending on the area you're hunting, what slope you're looking at. But I know here in southwest Montana that has fairly open mountain ranges that I catch a lot of my bears on north side slopes. So I catch them on north side because there's a lot of timber and there's like these pocket parks. And these pocket parks are like little green parks or green meadows or green slides that happen on the north face. They keep fairly shaded so they don't burn off and so they keep this real neon green color. They're also real secluded that bear can come into that meadow and feed and disappear in the timber in seconds so they really like these pocket parks Uh, so I'm going to glass a lot of these and I run this combination when I'm hunting these things uh, just of master vantage points of still hunting and then also it's just like the country never lays out perfectly where you can glass everything from one location so I'm always looking for these master vantage points but a lot of times I'm hiking up a canyon and getting you know like this smaller view of this canyon but it's more secluded good north facing slopes and pocket parks that these bears like so it may not be a master I may only be looking at a few different uh, like bear features but it's like tucked away a little bit more and then still hunting Like, I don't do great still hunting, but I'm always making sure to have my head on a swivel, and I still hunt through some really good, like, like open timber or, like, parky timber that I just can't glass from anywhere, but I can hike through, and I'll see sign in there, and and that's the other thing with these bears is, like, you're seeing fresh bear scat as you hike around, and all this is, like, telling you a story of where the bears are and where they're liking elevation, where they're at. When you see tracks, you can see size and know there's a bear in the area but I'm running a combination of all these tactics but I I love this early season as they really get keyed into the grass and as it gets later in the season the timber starts to green up and then you know these bears they um they they can feed anywhere and so they can wander through and they'll still feed parks and meadows but they can feed through the timber as well which can make them tougher to locate and then into the final phase of the season is like the rut and these boars really get moving and they're looking for sows to breed in this you know late may early june and if you catch a boar with a sow he'll be preoccupied and then you can usually judge him up pretty good because he's with a sow and I've killed some great boars that are uh, breeding sows or uh, at, at least following them around or hanging out with them. And so, you know, the last part of the season can be a very productive part of the season. So, like, back to the tactics of hunting them. Like, I really like vantage points and I like hiking my way through these vantage points. And I will still hunt, but, you know, it's very rare that I'll still hunt a whole day. And if I'm still hunting, like, I'll pick a ridge line that I can hike down that's going to give me different viewpoints at different parks. And I may sit down for 15, 20 minutes, glass, keep moving. When I get another opening, I'll sit down and glass. And then these bears, you know, I had mentioned, like, the south-facing slopes here in southwest Montana with open mountain ranges. But when I travel to other places and hunt bears, like western Montana, there's a lot of timber there. And I look on the north slopes, and it's all timber. There's no green grass. And so the bears prefer south slopes there because their south slopes aren't as open and don't burn off. And they have, like, sparsely timbered south slopes. And so, you know, I spot the bears on the south slope. And I think it's important to, like, gain information in the area that you're hunting and then transpose that information into different areas inside that unit or inside that that area. So like if you're seeing bears, it's like take note of it and then go to the map and try to find other areas that are similar elevations, similar parks, similar facing slopes. And then always paying attention to sign. Uh, I'll still hunt two of these vantage points. And then also like still hunting skitter roads works really good. Like skitter roads 
are like the highways for these bears. They want the easiest route through country, and these skitter roads, they're usually through the timber, but they have to cut the timber down where the skitter road is, and so it lets light in. And so this light, it greens up these skitter roads with green grass on the edges, and so these bears love to travel them, love to feed that green grass. So if you're still hunting, it makes sense to walk down these skitter roads, and I have a bunch of skitter roads that I'll hike down and hunt. Like I say, I don't normally do an all-day of... um, still hunting, but I will still hunt to my different vantage points and then send on a vantage point. And then time on these vantage points just depends how much I can see, how confident I am in it. Do I link together vantage points? Like a lot of times I'll go to a vantage point and I'll sit for an hour, hour and a half. You know, sometimes I'll even sit a couple hours if I can, uh, if it's a great vantage point, but then I'll have another vantage point that I can hike or still hunt to and then set up on this vantage point so I can hit multiple vantage points in one day. So I just kind of link together country this way, start learning country, where bears like, different vantage points, and then every day is different. I can go to a master vantage point one day and not see a bear, and then the next day I can go there and there, there'll be two or three bears out. So it can just be fickle like this where you just have to spend your time behind your glass. And so uh, bears usually pop in the glass because they have color, like they're usually dark colored even though there are a lot of blonde bears around here, but they really pop in the glass. So like a pair of 10 by is perfect for those things um you know if you're looking farther distances of course you can break out the 15s you can glass super long distances in the scope or use the scope to be able to field judge these bears up so um i kind of use like all this different glass depending on where i'm looking and how far and and how close and and Man, it's just like you just spend the time behind the glass and eventually these things start to pop and you start to see them. So um, bears as far as time of day, like I, everybody has different different success on the different style of hunting they like to do. So you can definitely hunt bears in the morning. I tend to hunt like later morning if I'm going to go hunt bears. So I'll start at 10 and then I'll go through middle of the day and middle of the day is great to hunt bears. And See, it's like different throughout the season. Like in the start of the season, you know, a rainy or snowy day or miserable miserable weather day, I won't see much. They'll be back in their dens. They won't be coming out. Uh, they'll be balled up in the timber, won't come out. But then as it gets late in the season and it's hot out, you get those rainy days where it's cooler and rainy and those days, those bears will be out all day long. And so it's really different depending on the time of year and the season we're in. But, you know, early in the season, I get sunny days and the bears come out because they, you know, been denned up for so long, had crummy weather for so long. Now it's finally nicer. It's sunny. There's grass growing and they're out wandering around. So it's just different depending on the time of year, the temperature. But my rule of thumb is I love hunting bears in the evening, like afternoon, evening is clutch for bears. And it doesn't always have to be last light. Like as it gets later in the season, it'll be last light because it's the cooler part of the day and they come out. But earlier in the season, like four to six is really good to me. Like these bears just start coming out like early afternoon and then um, start feeding around for the evening and they'll be out and about. And so It's like really different depending on the time of year. So like dial this in in your notes and pay attention to when you're seeing sightings. But if you want one sure time to hunt bears, it's that afternoon, evening. And so it works out perfect for me after work or get off a little bit early, be out in the afternoon and go hunt these bears. And I catch a lot of them in the afternoon, evening. I call it bear 30. I'm not afraid to hunt middle of the day or hunt late morning. Um, you can hunt early mornings as well, depending on the time of year. And I know guys have good success doing this. Um, I don't really catch bears early morning too often, but what I will do is if I catch a bear in the evening in a location and I can't make it to him or did not enough time or whatever the case is, I'll show up first thing in the morning and then, um, you know, hopefully I catch them in that same feature feeding first thing in the morning. So it's not like you can't hunt mornings or anything. I just do better later morning or if I'm going to hunt bears that day, I'll take off midday and then I'll hunt all the way through the evening. And just my time that I can count on is that afternoon, evening for seeing these things. So, um, you know, finding them 
it, it is just learning this country and drainages and having ideas and going in those looking for sign, you know, and it, it, a lot of this is like elk timing. Like, you know, there's a lot of spots where these bears are a lot of locations where these bears are using country. They're just, they're in there at certain times of the year when the timing is right. So you just have to dial that in. But I mean, basically it's just getting out and about and glassing around for these things. I, I live and die behind my glass. And so I really sit on these vantage points for extended periods of time. And I just glass around and I just keep, and I kind of memorize the train features and I kind of go through and I glass it and then, you know, I might may take a break or I'll start over and glass through it again. This is really where I turn up the majority of my bears because I can cover a lot of country. And um, so I'll, I'll sit on these vantage points. I'll find these different locations. And then once I find a bear, you know, then it's get the scope on him, determine what he is. Is he a shooter? And then, you know, I start looking at it making a stock. So if I can make it to that bear while I think he's still out in the park, then I will go for it. But these these bears they'll come out and feed and and you got to figure out what this bear is doing. If this bear is on the move and he's just cruising country like relocating somewhere and he's moving through one park and the next and now he's in timber like very rarely do I ever catch up to a bear like this unless I have a chance to to cut him off or something like this. So I'll just keep my eyes on him, you know. But if a bear is coming out into these parks and feeding, he's living there. And a lot of times they'll just be living around one of these parks for a week or two at a time or maybe even longer. Like they really like these areas. And so if you get in there and you find piles of bear scat everywhere around the edge, it's like, oh, he's living in this park. You know, I'm, I'm, I'd be good not to bust him out of here and catch him when I have time to get to him so when I first see a bear what's he doing you know what's his size and then I try to figure out how long he'll be out in that park they'll feed for anywhere from you know five minutes to two hours you know usually got an hour maybe an hour and a half they'll be out in that park feeding if you just saw him come out of the timber and feed out in there if it's the afternoon evening they might be out there for a couple hours and so I'm trying to judge this and how long it's going to take me to get to him um, you know, if I can get to them, it's usually like a full send, um, bears, you have to dial in the wind. So you guys have heard me talk about directionals and thermals and how they move through the mountains. And so, you know, my favorite wind is an evening thermal for these bears. So an evening thermal that uh, mountain air starts to cool as it gets shaded, it starts to drop off the hillside, find drainages in, and starts coming steady downhill. I know I've got a steady downhill wind for these bears, so I love trying to kill them in the last hour, last two hours of light. And that works out good for like my evening glassing for these bears as well. But you really have to dial in these directionals and thermals and you have to have the the wind right on these bears. It's everything. So you have to really dial in this wind when you're going to make a play. And so I'm taking in these variables. How long is he going to be out in the park? What's the wind doing over there? How long will it take me to get to him? And, you know, a lot of times I can't make it to these bears in time. So what I'll do is keep my eyes on them. I'll watch them go back in the timber and then I'll go relocate closer inside striking distance of this bear. So maybe there's a vantage point that's a few hundred yards away instead of, you know, a couple miles away. And so I'll close to that spot and then I'll watch and see if he comes out. And the same with like bedding, these, these bears, you know, they'll usually bed for, you know, anywhere from a half an hour to to three hours, but usually like around a couple hours, hour and a half, they'll bed down and then they'll come back out and they'll feed again. So if I can put myself inside striking distance, then I have like a good play on this bear when he comes back out. So I'm just trying to judge what the bear is doing, how long he's going to be out, what the wind's doing, and then the topography that I have. And bears, they're really nearsighted. So they will catch you moving and they will spook. But if they have their head down feeding, like I've hunted a bunch of bears in wide open parks and meadows where I can just move when their head's down feeding and they pick up their head and they, I freeze and they don't see me even though I may be 50 or 60 yards away in an open park, you know. So they are really nearsighted, but they will catch you moving. So you've got to keep an uh, eye on their head, which direction they're pointing and make sure you're not moving while they're up looking for danger. Bears will also stand up on their hind legs and look if they think they've heard something or they think they've seen something, they'll pop up to get a better view of it. 
I've always wanted to shoot a bear that stands up on me, and I almost had the chance. Like, I've almost killed a couple boars that have stood up on me, but it just seems like when they stand up, they're so high alert trying to get a look at me that I don't want to try to draw my bow because they'll see me, but um, I've always wanted to try to shoot one standing. But um, these bears... Like, uh, they are fairly nearsighted, so you can get away with a lot of movement. Um, sound, you know, they won't put up with a lot of sound. I've seen, um, bears that'll, uh, spook like a whitetail bear would, uh, like a whitetail bear, like a whitetail would at a stick cracking. And I, you know, I busted a big chocolate years ago where I'd made this huge go at it. And man, I was right in bow range and I had to just walk around the limb and it was a clear broadside shot. And I just stepped on a little twig and snapped it. And that hit that bear's head turned or snapped around and looked at me and I stayed there frozen. And then there's this classic move that bears will do where they slowly start to look away from you. And the minute they get their head turned, they just take off running. That's exactly what that bear did. And I didn't get a shot out of so uh, they can spook from noise. So have to be cognizant as you're moving in. You got to be quiet and really slow down your footfalls and footsteps and really pick your path to that bear. So, you know, again, like all animals we're hunting, the element of surprise is so important, you know. So you just want to keep that in mind when you're when you're hunting these bears. Um, they are dangerous game. So I have been charged by a couple different bears. And I've had buddies charged as well. So this is part like it's like really fun and thrilling to hunt them with my bow and arrow. But you also have to make sure that you're ready for an encounter. So, um, you know, these bears like the worst encounters you can have are sows with cubs or like a, a bear protecting a carcass or if a bear, you know, like really sees you as prey or something of that nature. Now, I've had pretty good luck with black bears. Uh, but I know when I'm closing inside a couple hundred yards or inside a hundred yards, it's fight or flight for these bears. So I'm trying to give these sows with cubs wide bursts. I don't want to just run into them head to head and give this bear a chance. Most of the time they're going to send their cubs up a tree. Mom's going to go up a tree and I can get out of there, but I just don't want to test it. I also hunt in grizzly bear country. So, you know, a lot of these same rules apply for grizzly bears is to give them a wide berth. I'm um, really looking out head on a swivel as I'm moving through country. And I know when I'm making a stock on a bear, like getting inside that 100 yards, I could get fight or flight on this bear. Now, nine out of 10 bears are going to go away from me and run, uh, scared as all get out. But there is going to be that one that gets ornery or pops its jaws or comes in and, and investigates closer. So I'm trying to get a good shot with my bow on these things. And, and I also have to remember that after you hit them with a the bow, they're just different than deer and elk. Like, they roar like a lion they spin and bite at the arrow they get really aggressive and um the couple times that i have been um charged had both been uh bears that i put an arrow in so um you know the first one i'm sure i've told this story on the podcast so apologize if it's a repeat but um yeah there is um a bear that i shot um, it's like the last day of season and I caught a, a boar chasing a sow and I made a play on them and got over there and they were right down below me at about 50 yards. I got a good shot on that boar. It was a great big one, big pumpkin head, and big chocolate bear, just a, a giant bear and uh, put a good arrow into him. Uh, bears. I don't shoot too close to that front shoulder. It can be too far in front. Now bears vitals are a third the size of a white tail's. So they just don't have that big of lungs and things. So it really takes precise shots. And then I like to shoot a bigger expandable broadhead on them that opens them up. Uh, they also, they they have like this longer hair that soaks in the blood. So for me, I'm shooting a big expandable. I'm opening a big cut and I'm shooting middle to middle, middle of middle on these bears. So, you know, I'm shooting... You know, I wouldn't say middle of middle. That would be like guts or something. But I am shooting a few inches back from the shoulder and really trying to put it in those vitals. Now, um, these bears uh, hit them with a big expandable. They bleed good. So I, I had this bear down below me 50 yards. I put a good shot, but it was more of middle of middle than like three, four inches back. So definitely a good shot on a bear. And I knew I hit him good. 
And as soon as I hit him, he just ran to my right and kind of disappeared behind this big fir tree right there. And I never saw him escape out of there. So I knew he's right there at like 50 yards. And so I knock another arrow and I get ready and I'm just waiting. And um, all of a sudden I see him and he comes around the the right side of the tree and he's just like going to going to run up by me. And he's like making a death run trying to get out of there because I've hit him pretty hard. And I think I've hit you know, probably liver in there, you know, maybe some guts as well. Uh, But it's a good lethal shot on this bear, maybe even caught the back of a lung or something like that. But uh, center of body. So, you know, as far as uh, high and low center of body. And so he's running up by me and I, it's like, he's going to make his death run and I huff at him. And I'm just in the habit of huffing because it's like when you hunt elk, you know, you mew at them to get them to stop just a ew. And I'm hunting mule deer, you know, I, I, I'm going to grunt at them to get them to stop. And um, when I'm hunting bears, I kind of huff at them, you know, to make them think I'm another bear. And as soon as I huff at that bear, just a like that, he pins his ears back and comes right at me. And I'm able to just get my bow back and send another arrow. And I, I always thought I'd shoot a charging bear in the front of the chest, but I actually shot this one down like behind the head and neck. They charge with their head down and into the vitals right there and ends up turning and dying like within a few yards or whatever. It was pretty close call. So after that, I'm like, hey, man, I got to carry a pistol wherever I go. And I'm sure you guys have heard the other charge that I had where I, I hit a bear and I hit him, and it was like that same scenario where I hit him good in the lungs, uh, like 35 yards or something. But I was downhill from this bear playing the downhill thermals, and when he was hit, he spun and roared like a lion and bit at the arrow. But the country kind of filtered him right down at me, and so he didn't know I was there. He wasn't charging me, but he's coming right at me, and so I have to defend my position. So now I carry a pistol, pull it out. I shot a bunch of times. I hit him a couple times. He did end up dying, but I did not shoot the best. That's where I started to build a shooting process with my pistol. So it's important if we're going to hunt these bears, we have to make it you know, home to our families. We have to make it out to hunt another day. And, and part of this is like being really on our game. That's really on our bow game, making really good shots on these bears. And it's also being really good on our pistol game. I carry a Glock uh, uh, 10 mil. And carry it on my hip, so I'll carry it in my pack holster. It's a paddle holster. I can carry it in my pants if I ditch my pack for a stock. And then I really practice my draw coming into bear season. So I'm going to draw my pistol. I'm going to push at my target, acquire my sights, and then squeeze shots. And so I can do dry fire practice with my pistol of drawing and acquiring my target and really get confidence going into season. And so that's what I should have been doing on that second bear that charged me. I was able to put him down, but now... I'm I'm just practice up way better and ready for those scenarios. So it's important if you're going to hunt these things with your bow, you got to be ready for these encounters. I've had a couple charge me. I've had buddies charge. So it can get pretty hairy pretty quick. So you need to make sure that you're ready for it. So as I'm stalking into these bears, these bears are really tough because they hardly stop moving. So I've been in bow range of a lot of different bears I wanted to shoot that just didn't stop moving and give me a shot and walk out of my life. So you really got to look for your window and then try to put that arrow in there. And just remember, it's a small vitals. I try to get closer on these bears than I would like normal animals. I think like, um, just because it does take such a precise shot and I want to open them up. So I think the majority of my kills for bears are probably in between 30 and 50 and, uh, you know, might have a couple in there at 60 yards and not many beyond that. So I want to get them close and put a good shot on them and then just be ready for the chaos to ensue when you do shoot a bear. Uh, It gets wild, but that... You know, it takes quite a few days to earn a stock on a bear that you just got to put time out there on these vantage points. And like all bow hunting, like time is just key of spending time in the woods, figuring out what's a bear feature. What does a bear park look like? Where do they like it in this range? What elevation are they at? Just spending your time out there and you get chances at these bears. And you know, like a, a big bear gets me really excited and I do like all the color phases and I, I have the majority of them or at least most of the major ones. I've got the, you know, big jet black. I've got a big blonde that's here on this wall right behind me. 
And um, I've got uh, chocolates, light chocolates, dark chocolates. Uh, I've got a cinnamon that was a great big cinnamon bear, had a big scar above his eye. So I love the different color faces of these bears. And, you know, I've described bear hunting before as like 99% boredom and 1% thrilling excitement. And that's pretty much what it is. Like you're just waiting for your one chance to like make a play on these things, you know. And um so you, you learn a lot throughout the season and it's good to like capitalize. Definitely, you know, I like that. You know, I like the breeding season. I like the late May, early June. They can still be in the parks, but gosh, that early to mid May is pretty money times for finding these bears and then having them in a park where they're feeding where I can catch up to them. So I really try to capitalize during that season. You know, I'll also get some plays in the early season coming out of their dens. I know enough canyons to go look for them where they show up. So I'll spend time in those canyons and eventually we'll be able to, to turn up some bears doing that. So it's like, again, it's just like gaining that experience on these bears. And it does, it like hunting dangerous game with my bow, just it like ups the ante on everything. And it's, I've always liked hunting different species and bears just gives me that real challenge I enjoy in my home state of Montana. I love traveling to Idaho and, and I'd love to go up in Alaska and hunt those coastal ones as well. Uh, my buddy in BC, like they just kill some giant bears in BC and hunt them similar to us in the springtime as these bears are like concentrated at elevations and they kill, like I looked, I was up there goat hunting uh, with my buddy and there was a bear on the wall and I looked at that bear and I honestly thought it was a grizzly bear. It was so big. And so I asked him and he's like, no, that's our, that's our black bears. Yeah. That's, it's like over a seven foot black bear that was just absolutely giant. So they build them really big and we've got good genetics, you know, here in our mountains of Montana and Idaho and different places. Like I've heard California has some good bear hunting, but it's tough because you need a spring season at least to hunt them in the style that we're talking about. Now you can do this a lot in the fall as well. And I'm like an opportunistic fall bear hunter. Uh, if I still have a tag from the spring, I'll kind of keep my eyes out and I might get a chance at a black bear in the fall as well. But I really like this time in the spring where I can really focus and concentrate on them. And, and, um, I think when you're hunting bears, you know, pay attention to the food source. Food is so important. So it's just like the greener, the better. Just really look for that neon green. Really look for secluded parks. Uh, pay attention to these skitter roads and then pay attention to the sign as well, uh, where these bears are at and why they're there. And really try to reason, you know, why these bears are in this area or why they're hanging out in here. And once you can find a good bear spot, you know, bears like to be around other bears. It's like other species that I hunt. But a lot of times if I can find one bear, I can find multiple bears. And sometimes there'll be three bears in a canyon or five bears in a canyon. And so these bears, they have locations where I've never seen a bear and I've glassed it a hundred times where it just, you know, maybe it looks good to me or it's South Facer, but then there's drainages and locations where I've seen a hundred bears and a hundred times of being there. So there's like these bear drainages where they really like hanging out. And like your job is to really dial that in and figure out where those drainages are and vantage points to be able to see them, you know, and still hunt through. Yes, still hunt the skitter roads, but really these master vantage points are going to be key for me for spot and stalking these bears and you know all of this bear hunting like all of this applies to hunting them with a rifle as well and it's you know like I think um you know there's a lot of opportunities out there like I have to wear orange while I'm hunting them with my bow now I'm I'm such a, a bow hunter that I have no problem doing that, and I'm just glad I have the opportunity to hunt black bears with my bow because, again, it's a dangerous game with a bow and arrow for me. So for me, I get a, a super thrill at it, but you know, hunting with my bow, I need more opportunities than the average rifle hunter because I've got to get closer and uh, I've got to make it happen, you know, which a lot of these stocks are going to fall apart in that last hundred yards or couple hundred yards to where with a rifle it's a done deal. And so, you know, if you want to get your first bear under your belt, it's not a bad idea to take out your rifle and, um, you know, use that weapon as a lot of these states are going to allow. Rifle hunting gives you an extended range. It also, you know, gives you the opportunity to shoot for a good boar 
and be able to capitalize when you find them. So nothing against hunting them with a rifle. I choose to hunt them with a bow as I it, it definitely is the next level for me. So maybe you get a bear down and, and, and maybe then you want to kill one with your bow or maybe you never want to hunt them with your bow and that's fine too. Like it's just a great time to be out in the woods and be trying to find and locate these things. I can put on good miles, get in good mountain shape and just go have an adventure. And it, you know, it's gotten more popular over the years, but it's still, I can get the mountains to my spe- to myself in spring bear hunting. And I can also use this opportunity to learn good elk country or good mule deer country like you are in the mountains exploring this country and you get to see like a lot of these bulls or bucks or you know maybe they're just deer and elk and they've already shed gives you a chance to find some shed antlers but you get to see their spring migrational patterns and and they migrate through the same country in the spring going back up into the mountains as they do in the fall coming down out of the mountains or winter time so you know these these travel corridors can be good and it can also be good to look at different populations in the health of a mountain range while you're in there so you can really use this time to to learn these mountains as well um Let's see, big broadheads, I I mentioned that. We talked over sizing of these bears. We talked over where to find them at, where to look at, the different seasons. Like hunting that rut is pretty good, but a lot of the bears you're going to see, these bears are going to be moving and traveling. And, you know, there's just going to be some bears that you can't catch up to or you can't make a stock on, which is tough. You've worked so hard to locate a bear and now this one's on the move and now you don't get a chance at them. But eventually like uh you'll catch one that's just feeding in a park or maybe he's chasing a sow in a park and they they give you a chance to be able to get in there and make something happen and it it's really thrilling to hunt these things when you got a a boar chasing a sow i've also had the sow get pretty ornery with me especially if you shoot the boar they they don't like that too much so like i've had them stick around and pop their jaws at me and i've had to kind of chase the sow off and even come back the next morning you know so uh, like I say, it can get sketch when you're hunting dangerous game, but uh, it's such a great time to be in the mountains and it's such a great challenge to be able to find these things and then execute on them. So, um, talked over size, talked over feed, how important those are. And then just remember they like to be secluded. I know I said that before, but bears just really like to be in one little park amongst a sea of timber where they can escape. They really like to be secluded. Like I don't catch them on big open faces very often, sometimes on the edge of them or sometimes moving through, but they just really like to be secluded. And so you know, sometimes I can get a master vantage point. I can look over all this immense amount of country and I think, boy, I should see a bear here, but it's like fairly exposed country. And so I can look there and not see a bear. And then I can go in this canyon and go hike into this canyon. And maybe I can only see five parks, but it's real secluded, good bear terrain. And I'll spot a couple bears in there. So it's really important to keep that in mind, the feed, and then also keeping in mind the seclusion that they like. Uh, elevation, again, watch that snow melt. Keep an eye on that. The the green wave as it moves up the mountains is they really like to be a few hundred feet below the snow melt. And you can catch them a bit lower too, but I really find that when I key into elevations, I do really good bear hunting. So key into that. Uh, afternoons and evenings hunt really good, but don't be afraid of a mid morning and don't even be afraid of an early morning. Or if you see a bear in the evening to show up there in the morning and keep an eye on that spot and see if you can catch him again. So, um, man, it's like, um, it's really fun. Good chance, good time of the year to be out there. Um, so yeah, uh, you can pick up a tag for even an out of state tag for, um, over the counter for here in Montana or in Idaho and in Idaho, a lot of places they'll give you a couple bear tags. So those are great places to go in the spring and, um, just go explore country and, and, um, spend your days out there and, uh, glass till your eyes bleed. And eventually there'll be a bear that fills up your scope or your binos that you get a chance at. So, um, I can't wait. It opens here April 15th. So that'll be my early season. And then, um, Yeah, it really starts getting good. I think it's important too, like when you're bear hunting, I see a lot of guys burn themselves out in the early season. So I've told you to look in denning locations and uh, rocky terrain where you can find these things. And for sure, you could turn up a bear or multiple bears in a day. But I just know 
it's like you can burn yourself out and not all the bears are out every day like this time of year. So you're, I almost think like good advice is like to go out a couple times, but just don't go too hard in this early season. Really wait till the grass starts to green up and it gets right. And I have mountain ranges where, you know, I can go down to a lower elevation and find bears, but you know, a lot of my money spots, the bears just don't come out until May or even mid May before it gets good in there. So I just bide my time and I've gone into these spots too early before and just spent so many days and so many hours glassing and it's just not right. Like you have to wait till the timing's right in your location, till the grass is greened up, till all the bears are out of their den, till they're focused on the food source. So I think like good advice is like don't burn yourself out and really if you're planning days to go spring bear hunting, you know, plan them towards the middle or the end of the season uh, more so than the beginning and not, you know, get out there a couple days in the beginning but I just see guys like go out there for a week or two straight trying to catch bears and don't get any sightings get burned out and then they're not bear hunting by the time bear hunting gets good so uh like like save your time bide your time wait till it's good wait till all the bears are out wait till they're on the grass the grass is greened up wait for the conditions to be right because I I have burned so much energy and time trying to go too early in spots and catch it right so Like, um, just be cognizant of that as you're planning your bear season as well. And, um, man, that's it. That's the bear episode. I think it's a good one. It's like, um, really fun to get out and hunt these things. So hope you guys get out this spring for some good adventures and then just appreciate all the support on the podcast. So going to definitely be putting these out on deer and elk and antelope and maybe even a early season deer, or a late season deer, and really try to get this information out to you guys as well as having good guests on. So I really like having these um, solo podcasts. I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, I'm not repeating myself too much as I talk a lot like about the processes and what I'm working on that time of year. And it's always like, oh, I'm, I'm running and I'm shooting my bow and I'm lifting this and I map research that, which I think is like crucial, critical information and super important and all the stuff you guys should be working on. But it, it just seems like my solos turn into those quite a bit. And so like I want to make sure that I'm intentional with the information that I'm putting out there when I do record these things. So like today's a bear episode or do a backpacking episode or whatever the case is. So, um, yeah, that's the plan, and we'll try to keep to it. Man, everything's going good. I'm in for a bunch of tags out west. Can't wait to see the draws come out in some of these things and starting to put a season together. And um, I'm really excited for hunting spring black bears. And then, um, yeah, training's been going great. Um, been running, and then I got a good trip in with my buddy Dylan. We set up the wall tent, went um, fly fishing, fishing streamers there for about three days, and was able to catch my personal best, which was just awesome. And so, yeah, been having fun doing that and um, trail running the mountains, and then um, yeah, just getting ready here for bear season and applying for tags and tag research and things of that nature. But all good from my side, still um, working construction and um, getting things done on the job site. So. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's keeping me busy as well. So um, yeah, just managing and um, good family time here lately. Like really spending good quality time with the girls, which is good. And um, just getting ready for another full season. I can't wait. So I'm sure you guys are doing the same. Um, good hunting on all your adventures this year, including your bear hunting. So get after these things. Go have some fun. And with that, I'll check in with you guys next week.